Good afternoon, esteemed excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Ramadan Kareem. I am Daniel Zaid, Events Director at Forbes Middle East. Hope you're all safe and keeping well during these times. Welcome to our first virtual session of the Forbes Tech Voice series, where we understand Life 2.0, a future post-COVID, and how this pandemic has fundamentally changed our lives. Delivering impactful content is at the heart of everything we do at Forbes, and we want to continue on that mission. In these unprecedented times, as we all work from home, we bring to you the Forbes Tech Voice, a series of monthly virtual discussions featuring the top leaders from across the spectrum, sharing their perspectives on how this pandemic has fundamentally changed the way we live and do business. The Forbes Tech Voice series is a part of the Forbes Tech Summit, which is Post, which is to be held in quarter one of 2021. And we're working closely with an exceptionally astute council to curate the content that will highlight the most pressing points of this disruptive era. I would like to thank all our esteemed speakers and you all for tuning into this session. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the frontline workers who've been working night and day to keep us all safe. Um, keep maintaining social distancing, we have the Abu Dhabi police and the government authorities online today, and I'm sure we don't want a virtual fine for this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on that note, I'll pass it on to Saraya Turk, who will be our moderator for today. Saraya, over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and thank you for all who have joined us. I can see that we have a number of participants, so it's quite um, exciting to have so many people tuned in. And thank you and welcome to the panelists. So as Danielle said, my name is Saray Turk, and today I'll be moderating the first episode on Understanding Life 2.0, Embracing Change. But for those of you who have taken the time from work to be with us today, I expect that the webinar will last for a little bit over an hour. So we will have an hour speaking time with about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the discussion. So for those who are tuning in today, if you do have any questions um, that are specific for the panelists, please do um, enter into the chat box your questions and we'll do our best to address those today towards the end of the webinar. So I hope that's clear for everybody. Let's oh. begin. So the current global pandemic, COVID-19, an unprecedented health crisis, has without a doubt challenged, tried and tested the resilience, the adaptability and capability of countries and governments globally in responding to the health crisis. Governments have been challenged on every level to protect their citizens um, from preventing the spread, ensuring and providing healthcare systems and treatments are adequate, creating an environment where life and work and business can to some degree continue for the survival of the economies. And most importantly, to lead strategically and effectively plan and prepare for life beyond Corona, what Forbes has termed understanding life 2.0. Corona has to some degree proven to be a process of almost a natural selection and forced governments and people to embrace change and adapt. And the most significant of these changes and adaptations is what we can see um, very clearly today, the embracing of technology and the acceleration of digital transformation across all sectors and industries. So UAE is arguably one of the, the smartest cities and the countries in the world and has for a while been at the forefront of using data and technology to position itself as a hub for technological advance, uh, innovation and implementation. But how exactly did the UAE respond and manage to the corona crisis with the use of technology and infrastructure? What challenges did it face and what did it learn? What did it learn to strategically prepare itself for the life 2.0? So today, in today's webinar, we will delve into a discussion with our four esteemed speakers representing different industries and various levels of government. We are joined today by His Excellency Dr. Amin Al-Amiri, Assistant Undersecretary of Public Health, Policy and Licensing at the Ministry of Health and Prevention. Uh, Dr. Lieutenant Col uh, Colonel Hamad al Nawimi, Head of IT and Telecommunication at Abu Dhabi Police. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Dr. Hamad. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Khalid, uh, Head of Strategic Transformation Program at Group 42, which is an Abu Dhabi-based artificial intelligence and cloud computing company, 
which is uniquely positioned in the national ecosystem to develop and deploy a holistic and scalable um, AI solution. And last but not least, Ms. Zaina al Qaisi, Chief Digital Officer of Smart Dubai. Most people on this will know Smart Dubai, but if you're tuning in from overseas, Smart Dubai is the government office charged with facilitating Dubai's citywide smart transformation to empower, deliver, and promote an efficient, seamless, safe, and impactful experience for those resident and visitors in Dubai. So without further ado, let us take a closer look from our speakers today. I'd like to begin with His Excellency Dr. Amiri, Ministry of Health and Prevention. The corona crisis is clearly a health crisis and the most immediate and priority was to, to contain and to prevent the spread to ultimately preserve life. So doctor, I'd like you to tell us more about um, how the Ministry of Health responded to the corona crisis and how it contained the spread through the use of technology, if I may. Thank you very much. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it's a good afternoon to everyone and um, it's my profound honor to join this uh, nice gathering from different sectors discussing uh, one of uh, the most important subject to uh, the whole universe, not only to the United Arab Emirates. Um, the government of United Arab Emirates, in fact, planned uh, a long time back in establishing a strong base and protecting the community of this beautiful country, the United Arab Emirates, by having different uh, policies, different laws. Uh, uh, and I will start with uh, uh, some of them to uh, give a sort of evidence that how the government succeeded to protect the community uh, at this pandemic uh, situation. The first thing that uh, we were the first country uh, in the region that we started to have a sort of uh, a strong strategic management with the farm industry here in the UAE that uh, those uh, 25 uh, international companies uh, for pharma industry, which they have the logistic hub mainly in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, that we signed an MOU and agreements with them to uh, have 30% of their uh, stock to be reserved for the government of UAE and to be renewed to avoid the expiration of those uh, items, either medicines or medical instruments. And this will give a sort of support to the country that at any uh, big disasters and a, and a bad situation, such this pandemic situation, we have a good reserve of medicines and no shortage will happen in UAE. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, we have ENSIMA. Uh, ENSIMA uh, uh, stands for the, uh, the Institute of Emergency and Disaster in the United Arab Emirates, where they lead the whole uh, 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 situation of the government of UAE federal and the local at the time of, uh, of the disaster. And SEMA, in fact, uh, started to have a, a, a continuous meeting with different sectors at the level of UAE and put some sort of plan of actions in protecting the community. And a part of it is the guidelines of the protection, the lockdown, the protection of the community, uh, uh, and uh, uh, providing uh, the... Uh, 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 and huge programs for the uh, uh, testing of the community with different sectors. I will say the hospitals, the clinics, uh, also uh, the drive-through is one of the, uh, 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 in fact, the uh, 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 pillars which we started through that pillar to uh, depend on in uh, allowing the community to test themselves if they wish and on an easy way and give them the result within less than 24 to 40, 48 hours. We started to have uh, a COVID-19 uh, uh, specialized clinics all over the country to be open 24 hours to serve the community. We started to have a sort of programs, uh, in fact, different groups of, uh, of, of uh, medical health professionals, like GPs and nurses, they are going all, uh, all around the, the labor camps, in fact, we are testing them. We are trying to uh, to uh, uh, take out the suspected cases and the positive cases and put them under quarantine and provide them with the medications free of charge. On the top of it, by the way, none of the countries will succeed to protect themselves and to be active in uh, uh, fighting against any sort of diseases or pandemic situations unless if you have you know, strong legislations. And this is not something new to the UAE and a good evidence and a good example that we had 
the Communicable Disease Law Number 14 in 2014. This was re released by His Highness, the Federal uh, President of the United Arab Emirates, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, uh, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, that we had the law number 14 in 2014. And this law in Article 18 and 21 gives the guidelines in how to protect the community and what's the actions that the, 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 the federal government through the NSEMA and Ministry of Health and Prevention and Rest of Health Authorities will be able to, to take it into consideration in protecting the, uh, I mean, the, the community. And a part of it was also in, in, in banning the exportation of the medicines, PPEs, medical equipments, medical instruments, but not 100%, just to ban. And we started since the uh, beginning of February. We were the first country to, to protect uh, our community and having those uh, items uh, 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 available for them. But we tried to, again, do a sort of balance not only to ban 100%, but also do a balance to support the export program in the United Arab Emirates and to support the foreign companies which are based in this beautiful country and also to help the, the neighboring uh, countries. By the way, we have almost uh, 75 scientific offices representing international and pharma companies based mainly in UAE. And uh, we are supporting from this beautiful country through the report which was published by the PwC that we support 41 countries from UAE with medicines, medical instruments, PPEs, and medical equipments. And therefore, if we were banning 100% export of those items to the rest of the countries, 41 countries could suffer. But we started to open the door for export and allow uh, and to do a sort of balancing to make sure that the quantity which will be exported uh, 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 on the other side, uh, 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 double or triple quantity will be reserved for the need of the, of the United Arab Emirates. And I will tell you now, uh, since January, 2000, uh, or January 2020 until today, and inshallah for the near future, none of the patients suffered by not having a room at any of the hospitals or ICU bed or a single tablet of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, Avigan, or whatever, uh, or PPEs, or, or whatever. You go, and even the uh, sanitizers, go to any of the supermarkets, any of the supermarkets, any of the pharmacies, you will see plenty of uh, sanitizers, PPEs are available, and with the cheapest price, even we control the price. And, and also the testing with, with, the, with, the, with the PCR uh, uh, technique, we allow the private sector also to open their door to do the testing, to expand the activities of UAE and testing the bigger, the biggest number of population in United Arab Emirates. And I think even the, the, the WHO announced that UAE is one of the unique countries that we had the biggest number, in number the, the, the biggest number in testing the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the people uh, 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 among the UAE community. Those are in fast, uh, uh, I mean, some of the, you know, uh, uh, items which was the actions from the government of UAE to protect the UAE community from this uh, pandemic disease and also to protect the market and to protect also the hospitals and to make sure that also the private companies will be able to function without any sort of difficulties and to allow them to export their uh, uh, items to outside the United Arab Emirates. Doctor, I mean, it sounds like uh, the, the policies, the practices that were implemented were very robust and they were certainly fair both to businesses um, and to the community at large. Can you tell us a little bit more now about the use of technology? So, and technology, <coughs> the role of technology in the healthcare sphere. So, last week I was on another webinar which was discussing healthcare specifically and was looking at the environment of healthcare in relation to so the use of telemedicine. So, that's become now more of a common practice than it was before. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening on that front? So let's, let's um, focus a little bit on <coughs> technology and the role that that has played specifically in the healthcare sector. Excellent. That's an excellent question. In fact, um, I, I, I will try to, to touch base on four points only. Um, uh, number one, the telemedicine, by the way, it's not something new to the UAE. I remember uh, the first, uh, my big, uh, my, uh, uh, I mean, my beginning life of uh, working at the Ministry of Health, um, uh, the Minister of Health at that time in 1993, I believe, asked me to be a coordinator with someone called Professor Gora. He was the, uh, the most eminent cardiologist from Mayo Clinic 
to establish the telemedicine between Maflac Hospital and Mayo Clinic in, 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 uh, 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 at the state. And UAE started the telemedicine since 1993, and this is not something new. And I think you were reading the news or seeing the TV interviews that many of our hospitals, either in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Sharjah or wherever, that <clears throat> the big procedures used to be performed through our surgeons and, 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 and supported by an eminent surgeons, either in France or UK or Germany or, or, or the state, which it means that telemedicine was there. And we supported this, this part of the, the practice that since last three years, by the way, it's not because of the COVID-19, but during the COVID, this COVID-19 pandemic situation, we expanded the, the, uh, I mean, the activities. For last three years, we allowed many of the hospitals, many of the uh, major health centers to do a, a, a sort of, uh, the, uh, like we call it, the distance treatment, to allow distance cons consultation, mainly for the, for the uh, patients with the chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, and whatever. And we allow them, even testing will be uh, done uh, by, by distance. And the results goes to the system through the IT uh, technology, and the prescription of the medicine goes automatically to the, to the, to, to, to the system. And, uh, and therefore, the telemedicine or the uh, distance, uh, uh, I mean, uh, treatment was implemented for last, uh, actively for last three years. It's not because of the pandemic, but during the pandemic, this was expanded. Number two, we allowed even the majority, or I can say all the hospitals, governmental and private, and even the private pharmacies, that for the, we, we don't want any single patient to go and visit any of the pharmacies all over the, the, all over the entire country. And we gave them the permission that you can prescribe for uh, any of the patients for three months, and it goes to the system on the on the on the website through the our HIE system, which is a health information system. It goes to the <clears throat> to the web based, and the patient can take his uh, national ID and go to any of the pharmacies uh, to request them by phone, and the pharmacy will do the delivery of that uh, medication door to door from the door of the pharmacy and the door of the of the patient's house. And therefore, we don't want the patients even to go not to the clinics and the hospitals unless it's urgently needed and not to go to the pharmacies a lot. And the medication will be provided for them for three months and we can, they can do a refill. Number, four, uh, number three, uh, we try to have a sort of an agreement with Hawaii that they have an, uh, to use the AI, artificial intelligence. There is a, a small vehicle, so beautiful. And there, I have a video. Um, I'm, I really, I forget to uh, to ask my secretary to share it with you here in this webinar. That uh, in one of the uh, in Sharjah, in one of the areas which there are luxury villas and houses, which the infrastructure is excellent, similar to the rest of the uh, cities in the UAE, uh, uh, this uh, vehicle will provide you with PPEs and with sanitizers. You just need to give an order online, and the vehicle will move from the center and it will drop through the Google, will drop the uh, PPEs and the sanitizers next to, to, to your door. You can just open your door and the, and, and the window of the, of the vehicle will open the, uh, the, the box of the, of the uh, mask and the uh, two, three bottles of the sanitizers is on the, on, 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 at the window. You can just pick at them and take it home and it is really uh, uh, sterilized. That's number three. And we are expanding our activities on that on that area. Number four, I think uh, His Excellency, my Minister of Health, uh, His Excellency Abdurrahman Al Awais, announced yes that today it's in the media that there is an uh, IHC holding company. I think uh, uh, Dr. Hamad knows, which is again a part of group of uh, I mean G42. Uh, they use the AI, the, intel, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, uh, discovering the presence of the virus at the drop of the blood. Usually, if we want to do the PCR test, we have to do the RNA extraction from the from the blood, and this RNA uh, of the of the virus will be tested, and the test will take on on the machine. It takes for minimum four hours, and to do a, a bulk number of the test for uh, people, it takes maybe 48 or 72 hours. But here, with this new technology, we can tell you in one minute and in 85% accuracy and that the, the virus is present and that drop of the blood. And this machine is very small, portable. You could put it in any of the malls, any of the hospitals, any of the uh, labor camps that you can just take a drop of the patient 
and within within a minute you can see uh, by using the uh, electronic microscope and expanding the vision of uh, of the presence of that virus at that drop of the blood and this is this is something that i can assure you that i can say the virus is presence in the blood of mr xyz and this is even it will avoid false negativity or possible or false positivity with the doing the test in fact Very the, yeah, I mean, this is uh, some of the examples of, uh, you know, how the UAE, the government of the United Arab Emirates, had a, has a vision to support the r and in UAE and to use the AI in supporting the, the health sector and to, to support the humanity. Thank you very much, Doctor. And can I ask, when can we expect to see this AI being rolled out, the, the testing where you can get 85% accuracy? When when uh, perhaps that should be directed to Dr. To Dr. Khaled from G, <laughs> G42, um, is that right? Uh, when, when can we expect that to be implemented? In fact, it's very soon. Uh, maybe Dr. Khaled has more details, but I got the details from G42 uh, people uh, yesterday and my minister, and I was uh, communicating with them for some, in some of the details due to my, uh, through my speciality. Uh, but uh, uh, they are very, uh, I mean, enthusiastic in taking taking it out and commercialize it. Hopefully, by uh, by, by 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 coming few days, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Dr. Amin. Um, fantastic initiatives there, and you really have highlighted to us um, the proactive and I guess the aggressive approach that we're taking to combat um, the coronavirus. So the healthcare um, system and, and the Ministry of Health is doing a fantastic job. Thank you for that. What I might do now is turn to Dr. Hamad and ask um, you some questions, Dr. Hamad, looking at a very different sector. Uh, Dr. Hamad is, as I explained earlier, in the um, Abu Dhabi Police and the head of IT and telecommunications. Um, Dr. Hamad, can we hear from you about um, how the Abu Dhabi police have responded? Um, I guess after a healthcare crisis and dealing with healthcare, the next is the safety mm. of its citizens and ensuring it abides by the laws, maintains self, uh, safe distancing and practices and policies. But as the IT head of, um, sorry, as the head of IT and telecommunications, what did Abu Dhabi police do um, in a response to the corona and, and how was that effective in maintaining a safe environment? Well, thank you, uh, Soraya, for the introduction and uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your uh, excellency for the wonderful uh, brief about uh, the healthcare sector. Uh, and just a small correction, I'm the head of the telecom section, not the head Sorry. of IT. Because it's a, it's a sorry, huge... Sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, just telecommunications. Yes. Uh, well, as uh, other organizations and entities uh, around uh, the country and federal and local government, uh, the police department is uh, considered as uh, the first and one of uh, the first responders uh, for this uh, pandemic uh, situation. Uh, and we consider as uh, the health sector is number one, and uh, I would say we are, would be uh, after those uh, guys. Uh, the reaction for uh, that situation as uh, a police department and a law enforcement, uh, enforcement uh, organization, it's uh, whatever the government and, uh, and SEMA, as what His Excellency mentioned, uh, whenever they set rule and uh, policies for the quarantine, uh, Timing. So this is when it comes uh, into the police uh, department to uh, uh, activate uh, the law and the policy. Uh, from the IT perspective, uh, I would say uh, we did a wonderful job. And uh, I mentioned two days ago at one of the webinar that uh, Abu Dhabi as the capital of United Arab Emirates and even uh, most of the uh, big cities around the UAE has uh, the most important infrastructure and the telecommunication part on the region. So this would help us uh, to, uh, to just move into the digitalization. And uh, working from home wasn't a big issue. And we can see how the Ministry of Education uh, had just finishing the semester and this year with a successful 
results and uh, productivity from uh, either the staff and the students. Uh, from uh, an IT perspective as well, uh, I would say, uh, and I would be pleased, we are uh, working uh, too hard to make the society safe and uh, secure. It had uh, an extra job that we uh, got during the COVID-19 situation. Uh, as you know, so the quarantine time started from 10 until 6. And now it's from eight until six. So there got to be more uh, patrol car and more uh, police enforcement around uh, the city to make it secure. Uh, I guess uh, it's everybody's uh, issue and everybody's responsibility. As what His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, just mentioned two days ago that uh, this responsibility got to be uh, delivered to all the citizens and all the residents who are living in this country. Everybody got to take the responsibility to understand that we are facing this, not as a government, but as everyone who lives in this country. Dr. Hamad, I'm just going to pick up on a point that you mentioned in terms of um, the UAE or Abu Dhabi in particular having the telecommunication infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit more about the telecommunication infrastructure and what you think is its, its success has really been during this coronavirus and helping to support you and the um, Dubai, oh, sorry, Abu Dhabi police force carry out its tasks? Well, uh, uh, the telecommunication or infrastructure uh, based in Abu Dhabi and uh, in Abu Dhabi police, we've been working for uh, almost three years into providing uh, our own uh, network and infrastructures around the city of Abu Dhabi, starting from uh, the Western region, Al Dafra and Al Ain, all the way to uh, uh, Dubai. Uh, in this case, we uh, established and started our uh, LTE network, which is going to be the, uh, the future of the, the police uh, work. So it's got to be uh, a data and a voice. And instead of using the old uh, system, which is currently used in the police enforcement, the Tetra system and the Tetra radios. So the LTE network is coming soon, and uh, this would support help uh, and help uh, the police enforcement to uh, get uh, the work done easy. Uh, most of the, the vehicles are going to be smart and uh, most of our police uh, officers and uh, the field officers are going to be using the smart applications and the smart tablets. It sounds to me like um, the UAE was really ahead of the game, um, even before Corona hit. So when we were presented with the Corona crisis, it sounds like the UAE as a whole, as a government, through its policies, its practices, and the technology that it uses being you know, part of a, of a very smart city and a smart country, um, has been absolutely effective. What I might do is bring in Dr. Mohammed Khalid at this point in time because, um, you know, Dr. Amin, when he was speaking, was talking about the collaboration between um, the healthcare and Group 42 as a um, AI and solution provider. So, Dr. Mohammed, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, what G42 is doing and how effective it has been, and particularly in the crisis. How has it responded and how has it upped its game to support government to be effective during these times? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I want to thank His Excellency for his uh, input, Dr. Hamad, as well. Uh, actually, uh, it's be uh, a combination between the effort around, uh, among all the sectors. And we've always been seeing uh, digital transformation in the first step of the future acceleration. If you go back in 2013, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the ruler of Dubai and the Vice President of UAE, uh, he said we are not anymore a government we are a smart government from this world and we don't want people coming to our service center to get the service or we don't want uh, uh, any delay in our government service and by 2021 uh, we're gonna be like paperless governmental organizations and that helps a lot and uh, for readiness or jahiziyah we called it for the response to any crisis by with uh, employing emerging technologies 
using AI, using surveillance system, using, uh, let's say, the resources on the ground and how sharing this information together in order to give you situation awareness in the real time uh, for, to respond to the crisis and giving the right information to the right people when it's, once it's needed to respond to the issues or incident or the crisis and how to deal with it. These integrations among the government and help the private sector and help the uh, government sector to employ these technologies and take, take it to the next level and let it working and talking with each other. That's why you find the, uh, the percentage of uh, safety of the citizens or residents in the UAE is the highest. Because as His Excellency Dr. Amin, what he mentioned, the drive through that's been done for the swab test, it's an innovative by itself. But how long it took us to deploy it from the agencies? It takes less than a week to deploy it. Why? Because the technology is there, integration is there, but the site work that was remaining and get it ready within the days. And if you go to the site hospitals uh, across the UAE or the, let's say the drive through test, within 10 days, all the UAE were deployed with these tests and connected, integrated in the back end system with the employing the technology and the readiness of the LTE, which Dr. Hamad has highlighted. That's why uh, we call it digital transformation is the first step of the future acceleration. And now we are having the return of investment, which is the government already deployed it earlier. We are working from home. Our business operation is not to be stopped. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalid, for your input. Um, very, very good points, and we'll come back to the points that you've raised in that discussion. I'd just like to bring Zaina in that on the discussion um, at the moment, um, because Zaina, you're from um, Smart Dubai, and I guess once we look at healthcare and have managed that situation, and then we looked at um, policing and law enforcement, um, you know, the next step is once people feel safe and they feel comfortable enough to resume their life, now they started thinking about that. So they, everybody will know in the UAE, it's, you cannot do business and you cannot work if there's no interaction with government services. They're, they're part and parcel of, of businesses and people's lives here in the UAE. So what did Smart Dubai do? How did it, how did it respond to the situation? How did it give people the confidence that they needed to slowly resume and continue almost some um, normal, normal way of being and life? I mean, to some degree, of course, because they had to work remotely, but, um, but to resume their work so that there wouldn't be an economy crisis, not just a healthcare crisis. Right. Thank you, Soraya, for that. That's actually a very important point. And basically what we saw during uh, the crisis was the unfolding of two realities, really. The first reality was, I call it the moment of truth for governments and how governments operate all around the world and how they provide their services uh, to the community. Why was it a moment of truth? It's because governments all around the world have been saying you know, for decades that they are going digital and they've been spending billions of dollars annually on digitizing. And when this crisis hit and there was a complete lockdown, that was put to the test. So it was a moment of truth in the sense that could people continue to receive government services completely digitally inside their home and there was no option here even to have one step in the process be a physical visit to a customer service center or a, a paper that needs to get somewhere that, that option was completely taken away so it is the ultimate moment of truth of how digital we really are the second reality that this uh, crisis unfolded was one related to i call debunking the myth of the impossible as someone who's been working in the government for over a decade um, many times when we want to completely digitize a process and remove any of those, I would call customer pain points, which usually include rubber stamps, paper documents and files and customer visits. Um, many times it would be received as, no, that's, imp that's an impossible step to remove. We really need that step as the government, obviously in, within the realm of protection, protecting the consumer. And what we saw during the crisis was all of a sudden there was a willingness, not only in Dubai, but around the world to completely digitize what was deemed before impossible and to make that a possibility today. And if we look at those two realities and, and put them within the context of Dubai now, 
I would say that we did well in our test on the moment of truth and providing digital services uh, to our users. We also identify that this is an opportunity to take that all the way to 100% digitization and to continue the momentum of challenging what was impossible and making it possible. And so if I were to think of Life 2.0 from the context of the government and what government 2.0 is going to be. Um, I would say to the bureaucrats, step aside because you're not going to like what's coming. What's coming is a government that is, has zero stamps, zero paper, and zero customer visits. And the bureaucrats don't like that all around the world. But step aside because that's the kind of government that is going to unfold. Now, when we come and think about, all right, that sounds great. How are we manifesting that on the ground and tangible results? And I tell you at Smart Dubai, the proof is in the pudding. So we have a tangible, um, I would say, outcome for this. And this is called our application, Dubai Now. Dubai Now is a one-stop shop government application. It has over 115 government services on this one app, completely digital. And these services are from you know, driving services from the RTA. We have police services from Dubai Police. We have health services from the DHA. We have services from DIWA in terms of paying your bills. You, we have services from Dubai airports. You could view live uh, flights and in real time. Um, we have services from the Dubai land department. You can get an ijadi. You can sign a, a legal contract. Uh, you can uh, uh, conclude your rent agreement on the app itself. So now you're renewing your registration. You're getting your driving license. Uh, you're checking your patient records particularly if they're with a public hospital, you're doing that already on Dubai now. So Life 2.0 and Government 2.0 is going to continue to take Dubai now and this idea of making the impossible possible and full digitization all the way uh, to encompass what we are dreaming of, which is the entirety of government transactions being 100% digital. And uh, a note on that, the way we're able to achieve this, if you think about it, uh, there's a question of safety and security. You know, how do we know who's who? If we're signing legal contracts, if we're, you could even buy, by the way, and sell a car on Dubai now, uh, including registering it with the RTA. It's all connected on the app. So the question of security here is obviously important, and it's going to be one of those things that bureaucrats typically hold on to as the last straw when they say we can't digitize that and we need a paper document and we need you to come with a file of three copies of your Emirates ID and four copies of your residency and this <laughs> thing. Um, uh, basically, UAE Pass is our digital identity. I say our because it was born in Smart Dubai, but it was a collaboration between Smart Dubai and the Telecommunication Regulatory Authority together uh, creating the first of its kind digital identity um, that is going to be used and is being used today on Dubai now to continue to unlock the last mile, the last tough mile. And it's nationwide. It's a tool that is being used nationwide across the Emirates, not just in Dubai. And this is where we're going to see how we're going to inspire Life 2.0 and Government 2.0 from the government context and the service uh, context. Um, Right, so we have big ambitions and Smart Dubai has been already uh, having these, these uh, deliverables before uh, the crisis, but the crisis has really accelerated uh, the way for us to take that forward. Thank you, Zaina. And it's, um, it's inspiring to hear. It's actually quite exciting because I think, you know, people often speak about it and you do see it in the, in the news and, and um, we do see on the ground that there is some transformation happening. Um, but it's, it's very exciting to see really what the future holds and, as you rightly put it, what this life 2.0 is going to look like. So I think exciting times ahead. But as you say, the bureaucrats aren't going to be happy about that. But let's see. I think the world, though, will um, be looking at the UAE and, and Dubai and Smart Dubai in particular to really see how can we effectively um, and successfully implement exactly what you've said um, it will attempt to do in the coming years. But look, nothing is without its challenges. Nothing is without its challenges and particularly technology. So albeit COVID has accelerated the adoption and, and, and the need to embrace change and digital transformation, and it has done so significantly, um, it's, still, it's still a novelty and it's still something that is, um, is not the new norm, if we can put it that way. Although there has been that um, term flying around so often about, you know, the way of life, is this the new norm? At this stage, I mean, Smart Dubai has great um, aspirations and we know uh, 
there's no doubt that it won't fulfill those. But what are the challenges you can see um, that you've either seen already or preempt that you will see? Um, because technology is always that way and it really is a balancing of of implementing technology, but as well as 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 balancing the the privacy, the security, and and the well being of of the users and the people that are in in the ecosystem. So, can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges and how right. SmartFi will overcome those? Right. So, Soraya, actually, I'm going to touch first on that comment you made um, when you're asking this question. You said the world is looking to see what Dubai is going to do. And we really feel that responsibility. Um, we ha you know, Dubai has always been an ambitious leader in all the fields um, under the aspirations of uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. And so... Um, at Smart Dubai last year, we were actually uh, invited to speak at the World Bank on this topic, and the Director General of Smart Dubai, Her Excellency Dr. Aisha Bin Bishop, in fact spoke to the uh, World Bank community right in Washington, D.C., uh, and to the hundreds that streamed online to hear. The question was, what is Dubai now? What is Government 2.0? Well, how did you come up with the concept of a one-stop shop for government with all the services digital? Because this is a novel um, uh, concept. So the world is looking. The other uh, uh, experience we had last year was at South by Southwest, if you know about it. This is one of the largest technology festivals globally. And we won there the Best Smart City Award, and we were up against giants like KLM and Alibaba. And we won this award for the concept of the one-stop shop, digital, fully digital government, and for our ambitions of the Dubai paperless strategy and 100% paperless community. So you're absolutely right in that the world is looking and we feel that responsibility to continue this journey all the way to the end. Now, obviously, this journey, as you said, will have its challenges and it does have its challenges. But I'll go back to that point I made initially when I said the moment of truth and the tests and how did Dubai do on that test. I would say the last two decades of digitization have really brought us a long way. And what's left right now is what I call the last mile. And that last mile is still left. And this is, if I were to describe this, I would say, this is when you have to go for a, um, uh, you know, a, a particular court case where you really need to be there in person. And that's still um, not necessarily completely digital yet. Or um, if you needed to test your vehicle or do your eye test. So those physical uh, interactions, I call them the last mile. But with emerging technology, we can even close that last mile gap. And so that last mile is typically much more difficult than the first miles, right? The first, you know, paying a bill or, yeah, or checking a medical record online. or that, That's the first, I would call these the first mile because that's data integration and just payment transactions, which all around the world have come a long way. The last mile is difficult because of its nature, because there has to be a, a, a maximum security involved in terms of who's doing what and how and, what and where. And so the challenge there is going to be slightly on the technical scoping side, and particularly when it comes to data integration. I think we do need more data integration, not only us, but the entire world. The good news is that smart device to support and enable a data ecosystem and more data integration, we have issued what we call the Dubai Data Law. And we've also issued a set of data policies. So law and governance are not standing in anyone's way. It's just really taking that, taking the measures to close the gap on the last mile. So I would say data integration is one. Um, number two, it is um, the push to re-engineer the processes um, that exist, not only to digitize them. So never take an existing physical process and stamp it onto an app on a website. Websites and apps that have upload these documents and go stamp it and then scan it and upload it, that's not, that's not digitization. And so wherever that is still remaining, we want to close that gap. But the good news is uh, that there's not much left of that. So we are, that is what keeping us ahead of the game from other cities all around the world. Um, and the third uh, component I would say or challenge here is adoption. Uh, from the community. So you'd think that that's probably, you know, easy because Dubai has a young and tech savvy uh, community. Um, but yet there's a shift, a big shift that has to happen from this is, trust us, this is really easier. Uh, a lot of people have done that already because um, I'm happy to say that Dubai now has over 1.5 billion dirhams in transactions annually. So we close over 100 million dirhams of transactions every month. So what that tells us is our users want to use a one-stop shop because by the way, they have options to go to all the other, you know, 100 plus applications that are there to pay their fines and bills and complete their uh, transactions. But they're coming to that one-stop shop because they like the, the fact that they don't have to download a hundred more and the fact that it's, we, we are always re-engineering the processes um, in this particular app. And so the, the, 
the citizen and resident of Dubai is a discerning uh, customer that is used to uh, one app for all of their hotel bookings, one app for all of their flight bookings, one app for all of their food. They're used to everything coming to their door. Um, that's Dubai, right? It's, it's high quality of life. And so we want the government to be not only equal to the private sector and how it, it, it focuses on customer centricity, but to actually even dream to be beyond uh, in terms of what it can offer. And this is along that path. So adoption will still be, uh, you know, our users want this and are using it, but we want to go all the way uh, in terms of encompassing the entire community with all of its uh, diversity. And so that is, uh, I would say that's the challenge on us to, to navigate as well. Definitely. Thank you, Zaina. That was very insightful. I mean, I mean, there's not much more I really need to add to what you said. Um, you said it quite succinctly um, and very clearly about how all the measures that it's going to take and really how ambitious Smart Dubai is being. I want to bring in Dr. Um, Amin at this point because you know, what Zaina was talking about is very much government services. Um, and she was talking about the last mile and really closing that gap. And I believe you can do that with government services, but can you really do that in healthcare? What are the challenges going to be in revolutionizing or digitally transforming the healthcare industry? Can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Soraya. In fact, the um Digitalization in healthcare has been taken, um, you know, a, a strong pathway towards the, um, as um, Zena, she was saying, close to the last mile. And I will tell Zena that sooner or later, even the uh, the eye checkup will be done uh, while you are at home. It could be done by an, an a specific uh, small devices that it could be, uh, or I can see application downloaded into the into the uh, PC that you can sit in the front of it personally and they can check the vision of your eye and the results automatically goes to the, uh, to the system. By the way, you know, the technology is uh, something that we should get use of it. And the success governments like UAE and uh, Dubai uh, really succeeded in uh, introducing the new technologies into the real life of the government uh, governmental processes and then what is being implemented with uh, uh, by the way personally I do uh, I do use uh, Dubai now in paying my bills uh, my uh, I have real estate small real estate company I do everything through uh, through Dubai now while I'm, I'm at home so I'm happy to hear that oh. I'm so happy to, uh, within the next uh, 48 to 72 yeah. hours we're releasing a version, uh, Dr. Amiri, that uh, is going to um, update the design. So I hope you'll like that and keep things sure. moving on the Dubai yeah, um, front. And, and I'm quite sure in the health sector, uh, uh, um, I mean, Soraya, uh, as per your uh, question, you know, you are even beyond the expectation of uh, many uh, strong developed countries that they started to for the implementation of HIS system, which is health information system, and to use the new technologies and how we will be able to use the AI in, uh, in, in discovering uh, uh, unpredicted diseases. I'll give you a small example. We managed with, uh, with uh, George Washington University uh, Hospital uh, uh, to introduce and develop, it. This, this, this technology was developed between the UAE government and 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 the uh, and the hospital. Uh, this technology is the uh, application. Uh, it's in your uh, in your mobile that we can use it with the newborn. In few minutes, we can define if this newborn could uh, expose to get any of uh, or, or, or sort of hereditary uh, diseases, and we can predict. Uh, 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 this thing and we can help in uh, uh, giving the proper medication to that newborn and protecting him to get that disease at the near future. Uh, HIE system is, is, uh, is one of it and I'm quite sure you heard that uh, we are working and merging the, the mm -hmm. HIS system between Ministry of Health, Dubai Health Authority and Abu Dhabi Health Department that each single patient to, to have uh, one file and then we will be able to provide the healthcare services to the chronic patients, uh, uh, I mean patients with the chronic disease while they are at home, and then they can use the smart application in uh, uh, testing their blood tests, the blood pressure and everything 
uh, by the way, personally, I signed an MOU with a company called Servier to use the AI technology that in a small device, it's a small size, by the way, it's almost uh, six centimeters. It's a small uh, device. We can fix it uh, uh, below the skin and below the chest that we can give the, uh, the, uh, the uh, or the device can uh, uh, study the, uh, the level of the uh, sugar for diabetic patient type two and to inject the medication to his body. He doesn't need to take pills. And soon, and we signed the MOU that UAE will be the first country to have this device in UAE called Etika 650. I, I, even I know, then the, I still remember the name of the device. And this, despite that, we are using smart application in helping even the mothers. Um, I, I can show you this is a smart application called Mohab. I don't, I, I don't think, I think it's clear, called Mohab. You can download it and you have four features. And those features, by the way, you can, you can define the name of the drug, what is the price, the active ingredients, and the manufacturer, everything. And you can order it, by the way, while you, while, while you are at home. You can do a, a body mass index while you are at home but through using this application. Even if you are a mother or a father, you are searching for a, a pediatrician for your child. You can find out who's the best pediatrician, uh, uh, pediatrician. what is his qualification, where he works, what is his number, what is his address. Uh, uh, and where is the nearest hospital next to your, your, your door? What's the nearest clinics? You know, by using those new technologies, really we are trying to help the people. And the life became so easy for the people who live in, in, in the UAE because everything is online, everything in a smart application. As uh, Zena was saying, you know, uh, uh, we are trying to narrow the life, I mean, the last mile as possible by using the strategic partnership with the international companies, either they are based in UAE or they are based, in, based abroad, and to make sure that how we will be able, how we will be able to host their new technologies and to be brought to the UAE, and to make sure that we will be the 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 hosting country and we will be the shareholders even with them. And this is the will of now the new government of the UAE that to have like a shareholders. And then the big uh, uh, IT companies and big AI companies, and to make sure that they have to have uh, you know a base in United Arab Emirates. I don't want to go farther. I, we have a lot of things, either in our ministry or Department of Health Dubai or in uh, the, uh, 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 Abu Dhabi uh, Department of Health. But I, I found those are the most uh, important that to be uh, touch up on. Thank you, Your Excellency. No, there were definitely um, very positive points. Um, and as you say, demonstrate how far and how advanced um, UAE is really. So it's not just from government services. I mean, what Zaina touched on, it really is in the healthcare space. And there's a lot more to come, which is fantastic. I guess one of the points that Zaina touched on, though, is even though you've got those systems and, and the use of technology, people need to trust those. So do you think that now post Corona and the effective um, use of technology and, and how far uh, the government has really come that, that people are likely to trust the system? Because I know when we speak about AI, that's still such a scary word for some people. It's such, it's so advanced. They feel like it's so technologically advanced. You know, if AI is going to take over a lot of the procedures that was once conducted by, by doctors or in hospitals or, you know, now no longer need to go and physically see somebody. How do we break that down? And how do we encourage people to trust, trust the system, trust the processes, and trust the technology? I think the, um, the, uh, the trial and the experience will lead uh, everyone to trust those technologies. Um, I think um, this COVID-19 pandemic uh, although it's something very bad, which a lot of people suffered and a lot of countries suffered, but I think uh, uh, this pandemic uh, 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 took us to trust the technology, took us to uh, really use the, um, the, the AI in, uh, in covering the need of the people with regard if it's in education and health and technology and, and industry and different fields. Um, uh, I think now uh, mainly the patients with the chronic disease, uh, 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 they are in a position to tell us their experience because really they are at home 
they are able to test their 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 uh, the level of their blood sugar their blood pressure they are able to do the the level of the uh, cholesterol in their blood and different type of the the, the, the test are part of the cbc which is which is the the total blood count many of the tests now is being performed by using the smart application which is downloaded on the mobile what you need is just to a click of a drop of your blood and connect it to the device there is a small device that you can connect to it and uh, i think uh, uh, we will uh, we will learn a lot a lot we are learning a lot now but, uh, at this time and uh, we will come up with many of the solutions which i'm quite sure the, it will support the humanity it supports the patients and it will allow uh, the the people to get benefit from AI and the new technologies uh, by uh, uh, distance uh, uh, I can I can say uh, 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 distance uh, um, management today um, uh, I I can say 98 percent of my staff they are working at home by the way 98 percent mm -hmm. and those staff are by the way health professionals and they have te technical issues and technical things that they have to do. And it needs something of uh, some some of the practical things. I will give an example. I have many of the inspectors that they have to inspect inspect factories, hospitals, and and pharmacies, and they are doing it by using artificial intelligence. By distance, we have special cameras connected to the to their mobile application. They can look at your clinic, uh, Soraya. What you are doing, and we have an application that will find out if you are licensed or not your clinic is licensed or not, and who is in your clinic, they are sitting in the, the distance or not, is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, I mean, efficient control are in place. Everything is being controlled by distance. I mean, this is a good example that really the UAE are using the technologies and we succeeded to do that because, by the way, this is not, this is not something that happened uh, 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 in January, uh, 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 at the time of the of the uh, uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, this is pre planned long time back. By the way, it's planned. Yeah. I can say ten years back. Uh, it's really demonstrated leadership and, now, and both sides, now, hasn't it? Yes. Now we are benefiting of 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 a seeds which has been planted ten years back. Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. I think what you've said there uh, really goes a long way to encouraging and, and putting um, the, the community at large uh, to trust in the system. As you said, the results will speak for itself. I might bring in Dr. Mohammed Khalid at this point, given that Dr. Khalid works in VA with AI and providing solutions to the national ecosystem. Dr. Khalid, we've heard the amazing, wonderful potential of what AI is going to do or, or has been doing to some extent now, but what do you see as being the challenges and impediments to, to perhaps um, the future of AI in, in the healthcare or in any sector that it's implemented? Because no doubt it's still, it's still a new playing ground. Okay. Uh, I want to move bits one step back in order like to take it to the next level. Uh, majority of the organizations, they don't do something called I. OT integration and this is one of the things that gonna impact the AI because the AI is based on the data and the data availability and the data integration because without the data integration or data availability I won't be able to build my use cases or my scenario in order to predict for the future the demand on the AI will be increased dramatically right now after the uh, COVID-19 and already increased earlier but recently will be more and more because we want to predict the future and forecast what you know, the future will be happening and how the sector will be operating. And I want to be able to know all of this without the data availability or the data integration. And if we want to touch the data availability and the data integration as uh, Zainash has highlighted, and this is one of the key challenges that's stopping the digital transformations and the accelerations. So that's why I'm focusing and uh, a lot of focus from the government industry to integrate the IT with the OT network or the operational technology such as the medical test machines, let's say, for example, uh, IoT technologies with the IT integration in order, like once when the certain function being requested or want to be executed or want to capture the data, 
I'll be able to take it aggregated, correlated, and therefore have it for the situation awareness and planning for the future. So AI is based on the data and the data availability. And if you uh, want to take a small example, uh, which is His Excellency, just he mentioned, 98% of his resources working from home and they are medical profession that because of the IT and the OT integration. And that's why the system is helping on that. For me, or let's say anyone would like to apply uh, AI solution, it will be applied easily because they're gonna, they're gonna take collective data from OT network, from IT network, from surveillance system, let's say from the telecommun telecommunication system. So, and it's coming to me in one platform. I just want to highlight one small example. If you go back to February, uh, Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, they announced their, uh, the first nuclear power plant in the Middle East or in the region. Uh, I want to highlight, you know, this power uh, ENIC is the first digital ENIC or nuclear power planet in the world and because it's completely digital. And that's why you'll find ENIC every day they are working and announcing and they won't suffer any issues. That we called it uh, readiness in terms of the data availability. So uh, this is like in make it in short, in summary, how the future of AI and what we need from the AI in order to make it more productive, especially when the organizations, they are operating uh, with two kinds of network, IT network and the OT network. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Um, I guess Dr. Amin and, and Zaina, you would have to agree. Would you agree with what Dr. Khaled is saying about the data availability and, and how that informs the AI? Um, what's, your, what's your position on that? Uh, sure, the data is very important. I mean, uh, data analysis is very important uh, to, uh, to help the proper implementation of AI. I do agree with Dr. Mohammed Khaled. Fantastic, thank you. I might just bring Dr. Hamad in at this point. Oh, sorry, Zaina, go on. Sorry. I was, I was responding to the question on data and I wanted to show uh, an actual example that we have live. DubaiPulse.ae uh, is uh, Smart Dubai's open data platform for anyone to access um, over 400 data sets uh, that are classified as open data sets. And we have a data governance effort in place today that uh, works collaboratively with the government organizations to um, identify their data sets, classify them, and if they are open, add them to the Bipulse, and if they are shared, then to share them between the government and G2G, you know, between sure. the that require them, and if they are closed, then to keep them closed in within uh, safe parameters. Uh, so uh, data governance, data is the fuel of AI. So absolutely agree with Dr. Khalid and what he's saying, and, but it needs a champion a central champion and that's what we're doing in Dubai and hopefully these efforts can also be uh, spread beyond uh, Dubai Emirates. I want to highlight one point Zaina thank you very much for this raising point up uh, let's take it as uh, uh, like best practices for deployment Re uh, majority or let's say 90 percent of the organizations I don't want to say government or private let's take it from the enterprise or organizations they do data classification when they want to do data leakage prevention solution. And they do the data classification on the uh, document level, PowerPoint, Word, and Excel, or any document they're going to use it. But in the data set itself, they don't do the data classification. And that leads to delay of digitization as well as the implementation of the AI. Uh, because I assume I want to integrate with, uh, for example, let's say company A and B. And the company A and they want to depend on the certain set of data. And I want to show it to the public. I want to be able because, sorry, this data is, if you're going to compromise, the corporate will be compromised because there is no data classification on the data set itself as well as security control on that. So I totally agree with uh, Zena and thanks for reminding me for this point to highlight it up as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Khaled and Zaya. That was very insightful. Um, Dr. Hamid, I want to bring you into the conversation at this point. We've, I think we're very clear on what Life 2.0 looks like in the healthcare sector, for the government services, Smart Dubai. We've looked at what are some of the challenges in, in terms of data accessibility and um, availability and the use of that um, in, with the AI technologies. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the Abu Dhabi Police Force is going to look like in Life 2.0 and what you see 
being some of the telecommunication challenges um, going forward, if there are any, but, but I assume that there, there, there must be. Um, but just tell us a little bit about that and how, um, how it's planned, how, how the Abu Dhabi police has really planned to overcome those challenges. Sorry, Sorry please. Connect. Yes. Uh, well, there is always a challenge everywhere in life. If there is no challenge, uh, our life will be uh, black and white. Very true. <laughs> and uh, I would say, uh, uh, from a perspective of AI, uh, we uh, do have an AI section just initiated two years ago. And uh, luckily, we got uh, four of our uh, PhD holders as a local who graduated from overseas on AI. And uh, those uh, four locals are uh, the core business of the AI section in uh, AD Police. Uh, they are working very hard. And uh, since the COVID-19 uh, occurred, uh, they've been working uh, an extra hours uh, from home and on uh, premises, on offices. Uh, you hear lately about uh, keeping distance between vehicles in Abu Dhabi uh, streets, just to make it safe and uh, secure. So the keeping distance between the vehicles in Abu Dhabi, uh, it's uh, initiated and an idea was built from uh, the AI section. And uh, I guess they are doing more toward uh, providing uh, services to the public sectors uh, and the society. As what uh, Zaina said about the services on uh, the Dubai now. Uh, there are so many services as well going to be uh, digi digitalized, as well as uh, getting a driver license uh, where uh, you can uh, be at home and have the virtual uh, driver license and uh, either pass or fail. This is where we need to take care of uh, the customer and the client. As well as we do have some services for the employees themselves as well. Because not everything is going to be for the, the clients, or indeed it's going to be like 95%. But at least our employees and our uh, organization staff need to have some services as well. And this is what uh, we are looking for in Abu Dhabi, please. Uh, where uh, lately we are providing working from home attendees to uh, employees, so you don't have, uh, as soon as you uh, log in to the system, you are just as long as you are uh, putting your uh, thumb or uh, the print uh, fingerprint on the attendees machine or just uh, a face recognition uh, devices. Uh, as well as so many services that are from uh, the in, uh, inside, uh, uh, terms for the employees themselves. Uh, Future-wise, uh, I guess AI will play a huge role. And uh, Jitex, uh, last Jitex, I guess Abu Dhabi Police were uh, showing their latest pedestrian technology for uh, the drivers that are going uh, through the pedestrian uh, cross lines. Whenever there is a pedestrian walking, there will be a, a fine and ticket issued automatically through this uh, uh, a new devices and a new machine. And I guess AI it's uh, going to be a huge, a huge game. Game changing, it sounds like it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamid, for your input. I'm just conscious of the time and I know we've gone just a little bit over an hour, so I might now um, take some questions from the audience and direct it to to the relevant uh, panelists, if you don't mind. So I might start with Dr. Amin. Um, there was a question for you. Um, how were the efforts of UAE in developing a vaccination for COVID-19 progressing? Um, and are these efforts part of a global alliance? Oops, sorry, Dr. You're muted. I'll just unmute. Um, sorry, Dr. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay, thank you. That's a good question, and it came on the correct time. In fact, um, uh, let me tell you something which was uh, announced last week. The, uh, 
the uh, Prime Minister office uh, uh, released a decree by His Highness the Prime Minister to uh, establish uh, uh, um, a team uh, chaired by the Ministry of Industry and uh, uh, co-chair, uh, I mean the co-chair is Ministry of Health and Prevention. Myself, I'm representing my ministry to find out what is the the plan of action to be uh, taken uh, after COVID-19 in terms of the self-sufficiency of uh, the pharma and medical industry. And a part of the, the pharma was the vaccines. And now, uh, uh, next week, we are fi finalizing our report to make sure that uh, which kind of uh, uh, drugs is being produced that can be used at the time of pandemics. Uh, 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 which kind of those drugs produce in UAE and which kind of drugs which we need to produce it. And a part of it is the vaccines. Now, although we do produce 1,674 different type of uh, drugs in UAE and a part 15, part of it is biological drugs. Uh, and now uh, our plan is that to concentrate on the production of the vaccines, not only for the COVID-19, but also the vaccines for the rest of the drugs, which the vaccines comes from outside the UAE. And I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the government supported the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I mean, the federal government supported the local governments and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the private companies to join the efforts together, in establishing the way and uh, the, the ways to implement the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I mean, uh, new technologies in terms of the treatment by using, uh, uh, I mean, the R&D and developing either vaccines or new treatment. And I'm quite sure you know that uh, Abu Dhabi government announced for using of the, uh, the autologous stem cells uh, for the COVID-19 patients, uh, positive one. It succeeded, uh, succeeded very well. And the rate of the success is very high. And so far, I think 85 patients has been treated by using their own autologous stem cells that we re, we collect their blood and we separate the stem cells and we re-inject. It's not an injection, but they, they, they take it through the nebulizer. This is a new technology, in fact. Vaccines will come soon, I'm quite sure. Yesterday, the day, day before yesterday was announcement from a company called Moderna in the state that they succeeded in phase one. Uh, phase one is the uh, trial on the on the volunteers, but they have to succeed on the phase two, which is the trial on the the limited number of the uh, of the patients. But you are going towards uh, pro producing different type of vaccines, but not specifically the COVID nineteen vaccine. But hopefully, by near future, we will be able to produce different type of vaccines as per the decree which was released by the cabinet, the minister's cabinet. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. And I noticed that there was another question, but you in fact answered that. Um, um, so one of the uh, participants asked what, that there was a notable um, decrease, which was very positive in the number of cured um, cases. So it seems that um, it was probably the stem cell um, initiative that really supported, and as you said, um, decreased those numbers. So I guess... Um, UAE and the healthcare has really done some, some great work in that regard. I might just go over to Zaina now because I can see that we've got a few questions that are being directed to Zaina. Um, Zaina, um, how can we put our digital services as a private organization on Dubai now? And how can we use UAE Pass as a private organization? Right, so actually that's a good question because we do support uh, digital entrepreneurs and startups and uh, we have on Dubai now today, um, if a journey, the, a service by the government in a journey requires steps that are not provided by the government, like for example, when you want to renew your car registration, you need to have renewed insurance. Now the government doesn't provide renewed insurance, but the private sector does. So in that example, we have added um, a startup, a tech startup called Yella Compare. Um, in housing, we have a full journey there about uh, you know finding a house, moving to a new house, but the government doesn't, doesn't offer uh, services uh, for cleaning, uh, fixing uh, inside the house. So we've partnered with a startup called Mr. Osta and added them um, onto Dubai now. So if your business uh, complements a journey uh, to complete the cycle for the user, then we'd be happy to have a discussion and take that further. The second question around UAE Pass, um, absolutely, and we're working with the banks as well, first and foremost, to integrate UAE Pass so that you wouldn't have to um, go to the bank to sign digitally for anything uh, and, and potentially 
uh, you can also get onboarded uh, via UAE Pass to an account. Um, so we do have efforts there and we can have a conversation as well. Um, you can reach out to our, on our website, smartdubai.ae. We have a contact email there and we do respond to it. So um, provide us your information and we'll, we'll be in touch on that. Thank you, Zena, and I'm sure that you adequately answered that question for the person who asked. Um, thank you so much. I'll move on to Dr. Khaled because there's a question here for, for you, Dr. Khaled, and it says, how is the collaboration done with G42? How is data collected to form the data sets for AI? And can you tell us more about how AI helped with finding faster testing methods um, announced last night? I believe that was announced just last night. Okay, uh, just to make it uh, very clear, because I'm not specialized on that uh, launching because that is a different team, but I can answer you within the information that uh, I have it uh, for that one. Any AI, depending on the data availability and the input of the information sharing with everyone. And if you remember, before we started, we were talking about uh, digital Berza or digital council or digital initiative we are launching it that that's because of the melting the ice between the professions across all of them and start sharing the ideas and uh, opinions and thoughts and uh, based on that we're gonna have like collective information to support each other and different sectors so uh, that one is like a kind of a platform, so everybody can sharing their knowledge experience in different domain and industry, and based on the certain AI collectively that giving you the result and again uh, and the solution for things to the next level. I'm talking just from the AI perspective, but from that solution perspective, I have to come back to you within uh, after consulting the specialized team, uh, the health team who were working on it. What we might be able to do is um, ask the panel, uh, sorry, participants if they have any specific questions that we're not able to get through today. I'm sure if you reach out, perhaps Daniel will give us an email to ask those questions so that we can um, address those um, separately after the, the webinar today because I see that we are due to or coming to a close. Um, but thank you very much for all of the panelists. It was a very insightful discussion. Um, you did a fantastic job at giving great detail into how technology has been, has really been used um, to combat and respond to the corona crisis. But not only that, what you've highlighted, which is absolutely outstanding, is that UAE as a government, as a country, under such excellent leadership, has was so well prepared and so ahead of the game when it really came to um, technology, the system systems, the policies, the practices, and the, the regulatory space. So um, great uh, great to hear from all the panelists. You gave us great insight to a cross-sector, and um, thank you very much, and thank you for all the participants. I hope you found that to be insightful and enjoyable. And without further ado, I will um, take you to uh, Danielle to, to take us to the close today. Thank, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raya. Uh, thank you uh, to Your Excellency, Dr. Hamad, uh, Dana, Dr. Khalid, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules and ha having us and coming here on, on, on a call with us. I think it was a really, really insightful discussion like uh, Soraya mentioned as well. I would also like to thank all the participants that joined us today. We had over 500 people watching this through different um, streams from YouTube, from Facebook, and obviously we had live participants as well. I would also like to just inform you guys that we will be posting more about the upcoming webinars on our social media handles. So do follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it's Forbes Middle East, and you'll find more information about the upcoming webinars. We're going to be focusing on one particular sector going forward every month, and uh, we'll have industry experts from, from the region and from across different spectrums joining us. So stay tuned, follow us on, on social media, and... Uh, you can also check out, you can also register for future updates on Forbes Middle East events .com. That's the, that's the Forbes Tech Summit website. And also you can drop in, if you have any questions to any of the panelists or, or to us, or if you have any general feedback, please drop us an email at tech support, uh, tech summit at Forbes Middle East .com. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Can Stay I, safe. Can I, can I say a few words, Daniel? Sure, 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 Your Excellency. I have three words, in fact. First of all, Eid Mubarak to all of you. Eid Mubarak to you as well. Thank you. And thank secondly, you. Um, uh, stay at home. 
and stay safely. And uh, third, uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, this pandemic situation will end soon. And uh, I think the efforts which were taken not only by our country, but by the rest of the, the countries and through the support of the WHO, I think soon or later we will end up with uh, finding out a solution. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that within, within coming, I can say, a few weeks or end of uh, June, we will uh, we will go back to normal, inshallah. Ta'ala. inshallah. Very much optimistic, and I want to uh, uh, to ask you that um, uh, be happy and uh, God will not forget. Uh, uh, I mean, the human being, and the God is there to support us, and we will get rid of, of this virus soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, you. for the wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Stay safe. Maintain social distancing. Good morning.